We're going to continue our discussion of leaf-eating, nest-making pests of landscape trees, shrubs, and flowers. As previously stated, I'm including the bagworm in this module because I want to cover it in greater detail. It makes a solitary case of tightly woven silk which is covered with its frass and pieces of host plant materials. The remaining nest makers are primarily gregarious species that use silk to make nests. These are the tent caterpillars and webworms. As a quick review as to where we are in the nest makers, we have covered the nest makers that primarily use plant material to make their nests. These were the rollers, folders, and tires. The case makers also generally use pieces of leaf tissues to make their cases, but the case making beetles often mix in their frass. There are several species of bagworms that make tightly woven bags of silk onto which pieces of their host plants are attached. This makes a pretty good camouflage. The primary tent caterpillar is the eastern tent caterpillar that makes conspicuous nests of silk in crotches of host trees. These nests are used to escape bad weather and predators. The webworms can be caterpillars or sawflies and these web over the foliage of their host plants and then munch on the leaves within the nest. The bagworm, which is often called the common bagworm to separate it from other species, is a common pest across much of eastern North America where it is most common below the I-70 zones. Each bagworm bag contains a single caterpillar that is capable of feeding on dozens of plants, including conifers and deciduous trees and shrubs. On conifers, especially junipers, arborvitae, and spruces, the larvae can defoliate branches and even entire trees. At this time, the larvae may also chew on the bark and devour buds. This can kill branches or large sections of these conifers. The bags are surprisingly difficult to see when they are covered with fresh green plant material. When this turns brown, homeowners often think they are seeing seed pods or seed cones of some sort. While the bagworm is most damaging to conifers, it can also be serious on deciduous trees and shrubs. Since a single female bag can contain several hundred eggs, it doesn't take long for a population to explode on a tree. In this image, you can see a couple of hornbeam trees that were located on a roadside rest stop. These trees were completely defoliated by bagworms. Since this occurred when there was a early summer drought period, a couple of the trees died because of their restricted root zones. I have even found bagworms on plants that I wouldn't expect like black willow and chickapin oak, which have some pretty strong defensive chemicals in their leaves. Bagworms overwinter as eggs. These eggs remain in the body of the mummified female and seem to be surrounded by some insulation-like material. Fairly late in the spring, when black locust trees are in full bloom, which is often late May into early June, the eggs hatch and the tiny larvae emerge through a hole in the bottom of the bag. Each larva spins down on a strand of silk and attempts to balloon. This is their only method of dispersal, and if there are windy conditions at this time, the larvae can be blown considerable distances to new plants. However, most of the larvae are unsuccessful and simply land on the plant from which the bag was attached. As soon as the larva lands on suitable plant material, it begins to feed and it makes a tiny cone-shaped silk bag. This bag will be covered with frass pellets. I call these the dunce cap stage. The second instar larvae continue to enlarge their bags and continue sticking their frass pellets to the silk. After a week or two, the third instar larvae greatly enlarge the bags and begin to include bits and pieces of their plant's foliage. 
The bags are also big enough at this time for the larvae to withdraw inside and hold the bag opening closed with their front legs. Since the bags are covered with fresh plant leaves, the bags are easily missed. The larvae continue feeding and enlarging their bags for about six to eight weeks. When mature, usually in late July, the bagworm larvae attach their bags to a branch or other structure with a tough band of silk that is woven into the top of the bag. This band of silk is so strong that it can strip off the bark of trees if you try to simply pull the bags off. It is better to cut the bags close to the loop of silk in order to avoid further damage. Within the bag, the larvae orient themselves with their heads down and they then pupate. The males usually emerge in early September. Their pupae rotate the tip of the abdomen which pushes the head of the pupal case out of the bottom of the bag. The male moths are black and resemble a hairy bee. Notice that the males also have clear wings as the normal moth scales have been lost except for the major wing veins. The females remain in the bags and when they molt from the pupa they don't form wings and the body remains pupa-like in form. However, these females soon produce a sex pheromone which attracts the winged male to the bag. The males have to push the tip of their extensible abdomens up the bag to the far side in order to mate with the females. After mating, the male flies away and the female fertilizes the eggs that have been formed in her oviducts. After this mating and fertilization, the female dies and simply mummifies around the egg mass inside of her body. It is always wise to remove bagworm bags when possible because the attachment silk loop can eventually girdle small branches of trees and shrubs. Bagworms are most easily controlled by removing bags in the fall and destroying them. In heavy populations, insecticides applied in mid to late June are the most effective. If you wait until late July, you can stop the bagworm larvae from feeding, but they will do what we call forced pupation, and they'll still develop as adults and females only slightly smaller than normal. The moth family that contains the common bagworm has many other species of bagworms that can be found in North America and other places around the world. Another common species is usually called the grass bagworm. This tiny species feeds on grasses, including lawn grasses. It makes a little silk bag and attaches pieces of grass leaves to it. These are not plant problems, but they often will attach their bags to the walls of buildings or decks where they are easily noticed. A common species of bagworm found in Florida is the Abbott's bagworm. This large species feeds on several shrubs and it uses small twig pieces to construct its bag. This one rarely occurs in population sufficient to warrant control other than hand picking and crushing. The eastern tent caterpillar is the most noticeable tent caterpillar found in eastern North America. It is a common pest of wild cherry that commonly grows along roadways, but it will often attack crab apples in home landscapes. The larvae make tents of silk and crotches of host trees where they are protected from rain and predators. In most years, the larvae will make a small tent near where the egg mass was located. As the caterpillars mature, they often construct a larger nest in a more interior location where there were some larger branches. The larvae of this species has a solid white or cream colored line down the back. Its cousin, the forest tent caterpillar, has keyhole shaped white marks down the mid dorsal line and the forest tent caterpillar doesn't actually make a tent. Eastern tent caterpillar moths emerge in late June and mate. Females locate host trees and will attach an egg mass that can have 150 to 600 eggs in it. 
This mass is covered with a shiny resin-like material. The egg masses remain on the trees for the rest of the summer, fall, and winter. In very early spring, just as the wild cherry leaves are beginning to show some green, the eggs hatch. The freshly emerged larvae tend to remain on the egg mass for a day or two, apparently finishing the absorption of the remaining yolk material. This hatching often occurs in mid to late March. The young larvae move to a nearby branch crotch and construct their first tent. They hide in the tent during rainy and overcast days, but emerge on sunny days to warm themselves, then move out to feed on leaves. The larvae make silk trails to the leaves, and these silk trails are used by the caterpillars to find their way back to the tent. The tent caterpillars can be easily controlled by simply removing the tents early in the morning with a gloved hand. Dispose of the silk with caterpillars in a bucket of detergent water or crush them. If insecticides are to be used, spray the plant foliage where the caterpillars will feed, not the tent surfaces. As previously stated, the forest tent caterpillar is the other species in the genus of tent caterpillars that lives in the eastern half of North America. However, this common forest defoliator doesn't make tents on host trees, and the forest tent caterpillar often feeds on oaks and maples. In the Rocky Mountain region, the western tent caterpillar is a common tent-making pest. The life cycle is much like the eastern tent caterpillar caterpillar with larvae making tents in a variety of trees but wild cherry and plum are preferred. Remember that webworms are the larvae of caterpillars or sawflies that web over the foliage of host plants, eventually encasing the foliage in the webbing. Most are gregarious but there are a few species of solitary webworms. The fall webworm is our most spectacular and common of the webworms. This species is found all across the eastern half of North America from Canada into Mexico. The adult moths emerge, mate, and seek host plants in late May into early June. Females will attach egg masses onto the leaves of favored host plants. Oaks, sweet gum, birch, apple, and some maples are preferred, but dozens of trees and shrubs can be suitable. The first generation nests are often loosely formed and more linear in shape. These are often missed. However, the 100 or more larvae in these nests, if successful, will emerge for a second generation and lay more batches of eggs on the host plant. This can result in dozens of nests occurring on the plant by August and September. Fortunately, this late season defoliation is usually not dangerous to the infested plant, but it can be very alarming to the homeowner. The fall webworm adults are mainly white, but the males often are peppered with black spots. There are several species of white tiger moths that resemble the webworm adult. The fall webworm adults have distinctive orange scales at the bases of their front legs. While the young larvae of the tent caterpillar are gregarious and remain inside their webbing nests, the last instar caterpillars will leave the nest and search for a place to spin their white cocoons. These can be found wandering about on decks, the sides of buildings, and other plants that are not the host for this caterpillar. It appears that there are two races of this pest, the red-headed and black-headed forms. The red-headed caterpillars are more common in southern states, and the black-headed forms are more common in the north. Both have similar life cycles, though the red-headed form can have three generations in the south. The fall webworm is one of the few North American pests that has invaded China where it is named the American white moth. In China, the fall webworm is a major pest because the natural predators, parasites, and diseases are lacking. It is a major forest and fruit pest in China. Fall webworm early nests can be pruned out and crushed. 
People have burned out the second generation nests, but this is not a recommended control method. Some New York master gardeners developed a method of removal that is kind of unique. In some parks, they attach a wire toilet bowl brush onto the end of an extensible pole. The pole is pushed up the tree to the nest, and the nest silk with the caterpillars is wrapped up and pulled out. The nest is then swished in a bucket of detergent water to kill the caterpillars. There are also some systemic insecticides that can be used to kill nests located in tall trees. This helps avoid drift of insecticide sprays that can occur with tall tree spraying. Notice also that there are a lot of predators and parasites that attack the fall webworm, and if you look closely at nests late in the season, you may actually see dead carcasses of eaten caterpillars inside the nests. The pine false webworm is one of the web-spinning sawfly species. It is called the false webworm because there is a caterpillar that is called the pine webworm. The pine false webworm prefers white pine as a host, but it will occasionally infest other pines. This one overwinters as pupae in the soil under host trees. In early spring, when the daffodils are in bloom, the adult sawflies emerge. The sawflies are flattened and the females have red-orange heads while the males are entirely black. Mated females attach single eggs to the bases of pine needles. When the larva hatches, it makes a loose webbing around the bases of needles and feeds on the encased needles. The frass pellets soon fill the nest and obscures the larva. This pest rarely reaches high populations that warrant control. An invasive webworm that attacks an invasive tree is the Allianthus webworm. Allianthus trees are also called tree of heaven trees, but most consider them to be an aggressive invasive species that is actually on the forbidden to sell list of many states. In spite of this, this tree often finds its way into our urban landscapes. The Allianthus webworm is a slender caterpillar that loosely webs together leaflets of this tree. The larvae can occur in bunches, and the combined webbing can web over several leaves together. The adult moth is quite noticeable with its bright colors that are broadcasting that it is distasteful because of the compounds found in the tree. The adults commonly feed during the day on landscape flowers, and they are attracted to lights at night. The mimosa webworm webs over the foliage of mimosa trees in southern states, but attacks honey locust trees in more northern locations. In fact, it has become one of the most important pests of honey locust trees in our landscapes. The pest overwinters as pupae tucked into cracks and crevices of tree bark, but it may also pupate under the siding of buildings that are near host trees. The first adults emerge in mid-May, mate and the females attach eggs to tree leaves or attach their eggs onto any silk that remains from previous nests from previous seasons. The larvae are primarily solitary but in heavy infestations their nests seem to join. In southern states three generations can occur and in northern states two generations are common. The second and third generations can build up to such levels that the entire canopy of host trees are webbed over. Mimosa webworm larvae are a dark greenish brown in color with some lighter stripes. The larvae are extremely active and will move rapidly or even drop down on a strand of silk if disturbed. When mature, the larvae often descend on a strand of silk to locate a pupation site. These descending larvae can be very irritating to people walking beneath the trees. The silk can feel like spider webs, and if the larva lands on a person, they tend to flip-flop around in an alarming manner. The adults are a steel gray color with dark blue spots. Females prefer to attach their eggs to old silk so trees that have been previously attacked 
continue to be attacked further. This pest can be difficult to manage because host trees are often too large to easily spray. Fortunately, there are some systemic insecticides that can be applied as a root drench or injected that can be effective. Attacking the first generation is the best strategy to eliminate this pest for the rest of the season. There are several other species of caterpillars and sawflies that can make webbing nests in host plants. Most are curiosities and rarely attack landscape plants sufficiently to warrant regular management. The cherry webworm is another one of the web spinning sawfly species and the gregarious larvae can attack ornamental flowering cherries and plums. Most colonies are pretty compact so pruning out the nest is a good approach for control. The juniper webworm is a moth that often attacks upright junipers and cedars. The nests are often embedded deep in the branches and are usually missed. However, they occasionally build up populations that can girdle and brown the foliage of portions of the plant. Well, this concludes our module on leaf-eating pests that actually consume the plant leaves. Now we'll move on to a specialized group of leaf feeders, the leaf miners.